Hi, my name is Mia Bays and I run Bird's Eye View and I'm really delighted to be welcoming you on Bank Holiday Monday, a very sunny day, but uh, we have a lot of magic happening indoors. So happy for you to be here with us. Uh, we have a really amazing array of guests and we're going to be speaking um, at length about Women Make Film, which is the exemplary series by Mark Cousins, who you will meet very shortly. Uh, Reclaim the Frame is a mission to bring ever greater audiences to films by women, and we have been operating since 2018. Bird's Eye View started life as a film festival in 2003, and now we're a year-round mission, and we operate in um, 12 cities. And shortly you will be meeting, um, at the beginning of this conversation, at the end of this conversation, two of our key cinema partners, Home in Manchester and Glasgow Film Theatre, who sadly at the moment obviously have to have their doors closed, but hopefully will be opening soon. And it's really important for us. Normally we would be doing this in cinemas, so it's really important that they are part of everyone. I'll hand over to Kate to introduce the session. Uh, and Kate Muir is um, on the board of Bird's Eye View and is an exemplary agitator. So this is right in her wheelhouse, what we are going to be talking about. Um, Kate. Well, I mean, this is this is just brilliant. It is Mark Cousins' forty-hour film and called Women Make Film, um, and it is just encyclopedic and, but also very witty, very light on its feet, very clever. And one of the things I love about it is it focuses on the art of the women and not really the women themselves. And we're always talking at Bird's Eye View about you know percentages and how many female directors there are. And this is Mark just going these are goddesses, I am celebrating them. Uh, and so are we, and you know, it's in these little 40 chunks, you know, character, um, opening stages, sci-fi, all different bits of filmmaking. And so you learn so much about filmmaking in the way that you did in his story of film, which was 15 hours. I mean, it's quite a watch, but it's such a lockdown watch i think you could get deep into it and and really enjoy it and dip in and out of it and and it, it's really a pleasure and a revelation so many directors i had no idea about yeah i mean with reclaim the frame we're doing six months work on this thanks to the bfi so the first hopefully everyone's watched the first episode which dropped a week ago the second episode dropped um sorry the second part drop today and then there's another three and then you can watch the whole lot I mean we've been absorbed re-watching watching or tracking all the films and we'll get back to all of those shortly so um I will pass to Rachel Hayward from home to um introduce to talk about the, the what this work means to her um but later also we will be we will have an array of other guests after we have a conversation first with Mark. So I'll introduce those shortly. So I'm um, welcoming Rachel Hayward from home in Manchester, literally from home, um, but also <laughs> from home, a very amazing um, arts complex. Rachel. Thanks, Mia. And hi, Kate. And hi, Mark. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you again, Mia, as cinema partner of Bird's Eye View and the Reclaim the Frame initiative. It's fantastic that we're doing these things online at the moment. So for me, Women Make Film is a project that's it's really, really close to my heart. I've been researching archive work from women directors for some time now. Um, and so it was, I was incredibly excited to go on this cinematic journey um, with Mark Cousins. It's, it's a fantastic 14 hours. And these hundreds of clips that we see absolutely perfectly showcase of the range of innovative, talented filmmakers, and everyone is going to have something to discover here, whether we're kind of absolute film buffs or, or just dipping our toe in. And uh, as, as you said, um, the 14 hours of this film make for absolute excellent lockdown viewing. And no doubt anyone, everyone who watches the film, whether that's in its entirety or just checking out different chapters is going to be inspired to watch some of these films and to seek out some different things and it's that that's at the heart of my personal reaction to the film so my hope as a film programmer is that women make film inspires increased audience demand for films directed by women as well as increased appetite for archive work and then in return i would want to meet that demand so I'm really looking forward to the discussion today because I know we're going to talk about archive work um, and I'm especially looking forward to that future of film exhibition with a broader range of films directed by women. So thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to it.
Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so, um, Kate, shall we welcome Mark? So we're going to have a conversation with Mark Cousins, who's the um, impetus behind this incredible opus, which is an absolute gift for us. Welcome, Mark Cousins. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, Thank you, Kate. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about when when did you start working on this and and why <laughs> what's its origin story you know when a life's when you, uh, something is a passion of yours it's hard to say where your passion began there was a particular moment sitting in a, a kitchen in Stockholm in Sweden with my friend Anita and I was telling her about all these great films by the, the great female directors and we said we I think we had a glass of wine and another glass of wine we decided what should we do about this and we decided to try and show the work show the work you know not sort of do something more polemical or even you know biographical just show the work and we tried to fund it in uh, Sweden and we didn't so then I talked to my regular producer colleagues and friends in Glasgow uh, Hopscotch John Archer and Clara Glynn and they loved the idea so we thought why don't we just try and show the fact that there's a plenitude Lots of us assume that there are a small number of films made by women in the past, but we tried to show the opposite of that. Not that it's a small number, but it's a large number. And in some slight way, we tried to bring about a kind of paradigm, sh paradigm shift. That sounds a bit sort of fancy, but we wanted to shock people into recognition that there's so much stuff. Yeah. I was thinking about it just as this whole film is seeds and it's thousands and thousands of seeds that each one is going to go out there and, you know, grow a set of fans for that particular director. Like, you know, at the beginning, you've got Kira Muratova, and I've never seen any of her films. And I'm thinking, you know, what kind of special? Oh, we're going to have it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've got visual you know, aids with me. <laughs> and, and all these people that, I mean, just people that, that I sort of saw in tiny patches when I first got interested in film like Larissa Shapitko, uh, the Ukrainian director, and I saw the, 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 the sort of final films that didn't make with Ellen Klimov, oh well done, yes. uh, <laughs> with, with Ellen Klimov, just, just, you know, she died and then he made her film, and I hadn't seen any of her previous films, and I became obsessed with that film and then sort of worked my way backwards to The Ascent and You and Me, which you show, and really, you know, she is a mighty heavyweight, you know, she's a sort of Tarkovsky type filmmaker. And the idea that she was not in the sentence with Tarkovsky yeah. is like going to be the new conversation at, at film schools and in cinemas. And, you know, where is the missing word in this sentence? And hopefully, you know, you are providing it. So I'm very excited. Well, I, I, I really agree with that, Kate. You know, and the number of, we, we all know that people love Tarkovsky and talk about Tarkovsky but and I love talking about Tarkovsky but I get impatient and 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 this you know dec you know decades ago I, I felt that impatient why are we not talking about Larissa as well you know because as you know she's as good and so we need to feel a certain kind of fire in our belly about this stuff, you know, and we need to be, be impatient. We're not blaming people who haven't seen her work, but we're sharing the love, we're sharing the passion for it. I have a, a follow-up question on that when I was thinking when I, I'd looked through it again. And it does seem like Ukrainian, Soviet, Soviet Polish, Bulgarian, these are these great women who somehow got finance you know, in the 60s, 70s that, and 80s that, that we didn't necessarily see for women doing art film in England or America. And, and I wonder, was there something Soviet that, that brought some of that, that work, that, that allowed some of that work to exist, that system? I don't know. Yes, I mean, as you know, there are there were ideas in society in the Western world and in the Soviet bloc, and they were quite different about who women were. You know, I'm mm. no, I'm not going to romanticise the Soviet bloc at all, Kate, but we know that it got certain things a bit better than we did in the in the Western world. Like women should have their should have their hands on the means of production. And, you know, if you look at the films made in the former Soviet bloc, you don't get those sort of twee, pious, cliche, pious, pious cliches of what women made. You know, you get war movies, you get 
big muscular films, you know, and I use that word muscular. I really mean that, you know, the muscularity of the of the women, you know, and so we had to learn from that uh, about our conversation about the sort of films that are made in the West. And one of the, the things we were talking about when I, when I spoke to you before was things like Sri Lanka. You would go, you every time you went to do work for the story of film or you were at a festival in the country, you said, who are your great female filmmakers? Yeah. And you were telling me about the woman in Sri Lanka who was 86. Tell, tell us a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, so um, Sumitra Perez uh, has been a particular sort of excitement for me in recent years because I hadn't seen her work and I prided myself Kate that I know about cinema and films directed by women but this is this her husband was very famous but she came from a different background and she made brilliant films from in the 70s etc and guess what she's still alive and guess what you know she's still she made a film a couple of years ago and as uh, we don't really talk about her, you know, and we talk about Jean-Luc Godard and we talk about Truffaut, but she's in that league, I think, you know, and that's why I talk about a paradigm shift. It's just not, it's not, it's, we're not saying we know this much about women filmmakers and we have to expand it to this much. We have to start from scratch and ask basic questions from the beginning, like who were the founding figures and maybe some of those founding figures were women and they were women. I love in your statement of intent in the essay film I watched um, uh, that kind of frames your inspiration behind it and your, your yeah, your intentions behind it, that you said we didn't want to frame them, the filmmakers, as victims of the film industry as that would re-victimise them. Yeah. And I thought that's very powerful. Um, so how did you go about, I mean, how long did it take to map out the 182 filmmakers that you did? <laughs> yeah, often often the, the most important decisions that you make that you make in anything are those very first decisions. So way back when, when we started this project, the decision not to talk about victimhood, not to talk about female gaze, not to talk about industrial quotas, not to talk these things. I know some people are angry about that and think they should, but there's a there's a kind of um there's a kind of release from that. It releases you to talk about the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's what happened in this case. And Mia, remind me of the second part of your question. Uh just how you decided who to select. How do you, who do you select? Yeah, so I was looking at particularly was more most interested in looking way back because we know we know the great female filmmakers today. We know Greta Gerwig, etc. We know who they are, and therefore the contemporary audience doesn't need to be informed so much about them. But I wanted to really look back into film history and look into the twenties, thirties, forties, and think who was there there. You know, and it's not me. Loads and loads of people are doing this stuff. So I'm not a groundbreaker here, you know, but I, I'm a, an enthusiast and a, I don't take no for an answer. And uh, I am also um, determined not to accept received opinion and what the canon tells me what the best films are, you know. So looking way back to the 20s, 30s and 40s, that was a great time uh, to, to discover stuff like, and to, to discover the McDonough sisters in Australia, for example, these filmmakers who were making films which were as um, popular as the Charlie Chaplin films in silent cinema, mm -hmm. silent Italian cinema, you know, early Mexican cinema. There's so much... And this is what we have to get our heads around. And I know it's hard for people, you know, <clears throat> watching this and listening to this because for a long, many of it, everybody listening to this, frankly, will care about feminism and cinema, right? That's a taken, a given, you know. But how many times have we been at, okay, can I speak frankly now? How many times have we be, <laughs> been at a panel about women in film, you know, and part of me, and I've been to all those panels, I've been to those, part of me wants to advertise a panel about women in film and instead saying, sorry, we're not doing the panel, we're showing an Edith Kalmar film or we're showing a McDonough sister film or something, you know, to get the films seen by yeah. what any means necessary, because this will fuel all of us. And you two know, and I know, and people watching this know that we can be deflated by arguing for equality again and again. But what stops for me the deflation is to see a new great 
filmmaker whose work I don't know, that, you know, suddenly I'm on the barricades again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking, and I was writing about this too, that it's a parallel thing to Virago books suddenly arriving on the scene, unearthing all these older feminist, wonderful women writers like sort of Radcliffe Hall and all these kind of things, and putting a label on them, a green spine on those books, and then putting them out there. And it was curated. And, and me and I have been talking a lot about Bird's Eye View and Reclaim the Frame and curating, you know, because people are searching around madly for what am I going to watch next? I don't know which series to watch. What about, you know? And so if we can provide that kind of library space online and elsewhere for people to enter into uh, and find these absolute treasures, and I, and I think this is a really sort of exciting moment. And, and I think we, the next thing, and I think you're going to talk about it later, Mia, is how do we cause this to expand and how do we reclaim the canon as well as reclaiming the frame? Because this is what we're doing, isn't it? We're reclaiming the female canon. Um, and that, that's a job. That's the beginning of a whole new job, I think, that we've got to do. Yeah, and the film canon as well. You know, if we if we if we get to the point where we say, you know, we are not happy if the best films ever made are considered to be by Ingmar Bergman and Antonioni and you know Fellini and Orson Welles, we are we will not take that anymore. I love all those films, mm. but we cannot accept that as a statement of fact because mm -hmm. it's not true mm -hmm. yeah i think you're absolutely tell us a little bit about the international reaction to this because i know you've started selling it as a tv series um <laughs> around, the, around the world and and what what has been the hunger for such a thing yeah i mean it's been it's been lovely kate internationally you know it, the films just, it played uh, on finnish tv and, and, and national tv and, and the finnish tv station bought loads and loads of films uh directed by the 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 women featured and not only by the women featured and that you know that, that this has been replicated elsewhere you know that these films are being bought and shown and the people who made them are getting some money in their pocket which is nice you know and brazil <laughs> under lockdown that was very nice uh, they, they, it showed there and in spain before lockdown it played in cinemas and and it's it's been sold very very far and wide you know much um, further and wider than anything that I've been involved with. And, you know, obviously we had a zeitgeist moment, you know, because people suddenly felt either passionate about the sort of post-Weinstein world or guilty or angry that they hadn't done more. But mm. whatever reason, you know, it, the film has sold quite widely which is really good and you know we have announcements to make i'm sorry we can't make it tonight but i know some i've told both of you this but we have to keep it private but we've got a major announcement to make about you know what's happening in other countries and you know in this country has been a bit behind the curve on this but you know hopefully we'll get there mm -hmm. yeah. um so mark as you know we have a lineup of of, of different experts coming back at this topic from different from their different range of expertise. And so we'll start with Pamela Hutchinson. Um, so I'd like to welcome Pamela, who we work together with on Be Natural, which is the amazing film about Alice Guy Blaché. Um, so welcome, Pamela is a film critic and writer and film historian. And so first of all, I um, wanted to ask, invite Pamela to actually respond to the work and, and then to posit a point to Mark. All right, so uh, thank you very much for having me on. Um, it's quite interesting to me, one of the first things you think when you, as a critic, encounter a 14 hour documentary is the word that is gonna come to you or someone's gonna ask you is the word indulgence. Um, I've been asked this about every long film I've ever talked about and I'm afraid I binge watched this documentary. I watched it in three days, or well, mostly in two, <laughs> mostly in one, let's be honest. Um, and so I felt like it was a little bit of an indulgence for me um, because I'm, I'm sure you're aware that I, I appreciate quite a lot of these filmmakers and I was introduced to so many new ones, but it was quite indulgent to me to be in your space, as it were, Mark, when you talk about not wanting to bring in the polemical or biographical elements. Um, it's something I want to get back to, but it was, it was quite liberating when I was watching it not to be thinking about those issues. Um, 
the first thing was I just I get asked the question quite a lot if I talk about the silent era and I talk about women in the silent era is that and um, people say oh were there really that many female filmmakers or they say sometimes you know perhaps women don't like to make films or they don't make good films so thank you for giving me something that I can um slam onto people's desks so uh, I've never said this about film before just the fact that it's big actually helps me <laughs> quite a lot so um you know it could have been a bit longer if you're going to do that yeah totally <laughs> It's always really good to be able to talk about abundance rather than scarcity because the next questions that I always get asked it are, you know, either, you know, why did these women stop making films? And, you know, there's many, many reasons to that. Or, you know, people say, you know, who was the equivalent of? In fact, that's the only moment in the film where I kind of jumped out of that bubble was when you said, you know, a certain filmmaker was comparable to Eisenstein or Scorsese or so on because I remember that we still use these uh, judgments, these benchmarks for people's work, because that's what people are familiar with. Uh, but, you know, it was very nice. I think it's a bit of a, a fib on my part to suggest that the polemical and biographical elements aren't there, because I think they are there in the gaps in the film or, or in what you say about the films. I was really intrigued every time I looked at a film, normally by a filmmaker I'd never heard of, and I saw the print quality so rapidly different. I think that tells a story in itself. Um, occasionally, when you talked about the film Araya, about the salt miners that shared a prize at the Cannes Film Festival with Hiroshima Monomor, I think that in itself tells you something about how film history has got written. And um, so, you know, I don't think that you can actually escape this historical element, which is what I'm particularly interested in. Nevertheless, I thought of the film uh, really more as a gallery than as a museum, as you say, just looking at the art rather than telling the stories. I hope that if it is used as a film school, people will Sorry. bring that in, that um, people will talk about uh, why we don't know about these women. I like the idea that um, people at film school or university this year or next year might watch Lois Weber films instead of D.W. Griffith's films. You know, I think that it's fine because I think that we've always been encouraged to watch the great films by men and then go on to the films by women if they're available. And they haven't been, although uh, it's a little bit better now. Um, I sometimes uh, feel like a little bit privileged because I work on the silent era a bit. So I get to know about some of these great filmmakers you're talking about the Madonna sisters, but obviously Alice Guy Blaché, who I always hate calling um, the first female film director. She's just one of the first film directors. And I think, you know, that's how you bill her in the, in the film as well. But I was confronted with my own prejudices here. You know, when I saw someone who I knew, who I loved, when I saw Mai Zetterling or Lois Weber, I was very, very happy. And then suddenly I was in Sri Lanka and my mind was blown. So, so thank you for confronting my own geographical prejudices with this film. Um, just because I would rather have had more of everything, that doesn't uh, affect that. I wanted to ask you a question, if I can. Yeah. Um, just because this is the way that I think about women in film and film history, it might sound obvious, but I wanted to know why you chose to focus on female directors rather than writers, producers, editors, anyone else in the creative field. Yeah, but it, Pamela, the obvious, the, the main answer is because I'm a director myself, and you know, I you kind of stick to what you know. Mm. You know, uh, I, I've never, I've heard lots of people say that that the auteur is is a male idea. I've never believed that because the greatest auteur in our living memory is Agnes Varda. So I've never really believed that thing at all. My Zetterling is a great mm. auteur. So it's not that. It's just that directing is what I know. And also, if you look at a, you know, if you, a, you there isn't mu very much about sound in this film because often the director doesn't control the sound elements, for example, you know, and quite often the director doesn't write as well. So I just, you know, we had limited time. And so I wanted to focus on what you could just call the central role. And I'm not, I'm not, it's not a totally hierarchical point, but it's just like the coordinating role. And let's be honest, you know, that the directing is the kind of central job. It's the most, par most powerful job. And if we're talking about women in power also, it's really useful to talk about powerful directors who are women. You know, we can get beyond to that into more subtle conversations, but it's very, very nice to talk about, for example, Olga Preobrazhenskaya or Janfisa Keiko in terms of their power as image makers and image thinkers. 
Then people can disagree, but let's at least put that on the table. Uh, it's interesting what you say about the image and what the thing is, uh, it's interesting about this film is that people are seeing those images because those names don't have the recognition. And I like the idea that Agnes Varda is our greatest uh, auteur, but I, I feel that that might be not a view shared by everyone and um, they might be wrong, but that's, that's true. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I think it was interesting for me to have a, a 14 hour, did I just say that, 14 hour documentary that my brain was constantly in dialogue with. Why did he choose this clip? What would I say? You know, finding connections myself, you know, I, I don't know, I'm sure everyone else noticed that female film directors seem to be obsessed with hands and feet. And now we need to go and do the hands and feet documentary. Yeah, um, there's loads of body. There's loads of body. I mean, it is a, it is interesting, you know. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that people have written PhDs about this, but the emphasis on body and the non-sexual body, the body as mm -hmm. well, the touching body, the intimate body, you know, loads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's all in there. I think. I think, and we need to rewind it and watch it again slower. Thank you. Thank you, Wonderful. Pamela. It's a nice subject. Um, so now I would love to welcome Kim Longinotto, who has not one but two films Ooh. featured uh, in episode yeah. four, uh, Leave Out is the topic, and then in episode three, Politics. Uh, so, Mark, um, should we maybe start with you and and why you picked Kim's films for those specific Well, topics? you know, I've been really embarrassed. Mean, you're putting me in a slightly embarrassing position because, you know, I I really admire Kim Longinotto and I think she is such a great filmmaker and here she is in her presence, you know. And if you talk about even a film that isn't um, in Women Make Film, which is uh, Dreamcatcher, I remember seeing Kim's oh. film Dreamcatcher, which is uh, about this woman, Brenda, you know, and, you know, I hesitate, Kim, to speak while you're here. But, you know, that film is a kind of... It, 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 you know, we're all always looking for reasons to be alive, and Dream Capture, uh, Catcher, showed us a reason to be alive. And so, I mean, it was a total honor to put some of Kim's films clips in this. I think also what Brenda taught me is that um, no matter what you've lived through, what you've been through as a child, or what you know, what you've had to put up with it when you're growing up that you can keep a love of life and a joy. She's so joyful and so, um, you know, I just I just love Brenda and I think, well, she can, say, she can say to all of us, if I've got through this, you can. I think that's what I learned from her, you know. And she, should we say for our audience, she's Chicago-based, former sex worker and now working as a social worker. Is that right, Kim, or, yeah? She started being a kind of a sex worker at the age of four and that's all she knew, and she did it for 25 years, from the full time from the age of 13. So it's a pretty extreme life. And yet, if you met her now, Mark, if she came in, you'd just think what a glorious, wonderful, fun. I mean, she laughs a lot. I mean, she's she has her moments of real darkness, of course, but she's found herself again after after going through that. So I, I think she's a kind of a beacon for me. She's like a real hero. How, and Kim, how, how, how do you, like, I know I mean, you've been asked this a hundred times and we're on something else, but I'm just fascinated how you're attracted to these people and how you made the choice, you know, for for Brenda, for example, you know, this incredible human being. I mean, every film, I mean, the, the people I'm looking for really, Mark, and I'm sure you've noticed that when you watch this, I'm dying now to watch the 14 hours. But um, I'm, often women are portrayed as victims in, in, in films. And I mean, I was thinking about Piccadilly, you know, the, the, the gorgeous woman. She has to, she, I remember a, a, a review. You mean the, said, silent, the silent film? Yes, yes, yes. And she said, I knew I was going to be bumped off because I couldn't, as she's Chinese origin. So she said, yeah. I couldn't, you know. Be, so there's this idea that women, and the people I, I sort of am attracted to and want to make films about are rebels. They're people that have um, survived and often extraordinary experiences, like Selma, who was locked away in a room from the age of 13 to when she agreed to get married in Tamil Nadu. You know, they've all had these extraordinary lives and yet they've managed to recreate themselves and survive. And I think that's what I'm looking for. And I think because, um, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not a rebel, I'm not a sort of pioneer like they are. So I think that I'm sort of living vicariously through them. That's what I fear, I think, you know, is really I'm living through their through their triumphs. And can I ask you another question, Kim? When you're when you're filming these people, are you scared as you as you're filming? Or are you excited? What what or does it vary? Oh, Mark, it's just I go from you know there's a scene in Dreamcatcher since you mentioned it where um, her child, one of her children, come to the school where she's talking about rape, and I remember um, that. and she says, "I've you know I've always loved you, Mum," even though she abandoned that child and. I remember as I was filming, I was just weeping. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I thought, and it felt so indulgent to be crying because they weren't crying and they'd been through this. And there's me, this kind of ridiculous person, sort of weeping silently, trying to film, you know. So, and then sometimes I feel I, I have to stop myself laughing because the camera's shaking, or sometimes I just feel so. But I think the reason why it is like a kind of drug, and I, I even, often when I'm making a film, I, I think never again. I'd never want to go through this again. Let's just have a nice, easy life. It's that yeah. it's the moment of excitement when I'm looking through the lens and I'm thinking what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing now, this amazing thing that's happening in front of my eyes, other people will be seeing it too. And it feels just, and it, it kind of stretches. Time is sort of weird. I don't know if it's a minute. Sometimes I, it feels like I've been filming for an hour and it's only three minutes. It's never, you know, it's, they're very short, those moments. They're usually three minutes. And it, that's what the drug of it is, really, is that wanting to get that feeling again. When you feel, I mean, even though you're living through someone else, you feel completely alive. Yeah. I'm really not <laughs> I was thinking when you were saying that about, you know, your film shooting the Mafia and Letizia Battaglia, um, yeah. who was the photog first female photographer of the Mafia in P Palermo, and that we were seeing it through her eyes, her female gaze, and then on top of it was your female gaze, and then on top of it, we were doing it for Bird's Eye View, was our female gaze. And so we were a sort of triple sponge cake of female That's gaze looking into this yes. film. And, you know, to do that with everything that, that Mark is now bringing up into our world. I know, Mark, could, well done. It sounds absolutely Herculean task that you've done. It sounds wonderful. I'm surprised you're looking so debonair and sort of, you know. I feel tie especially. <laughs> um, and, and supping a, a, a nice beaker of red wine, which has got a great anecdote behind it. Can you tell us? This glass here, I'm sitting in my flat in Edinburgh, Scotland, and everybody listening to this, most people will know who Jane Russell was, the great movie icon. She was in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe, and she came to my flat, and she said, I said, what would you like to drink? And she was a long time sober, so she said, I'd like an iced tea, and I made her an iced tea out of this very glass and i have to say this is the first time i have drunk out of this glass uh, since jane russell visited my flat which is nearly 20 years ago so this is in tribute to you guys cheers, cheers jane did you wash yeah. it our bottles <laughs> i hope you didn't wash it mark what uh, yeah well i didn't wash it but it was washed recently on, on, in circumstances that I won't describe. But, you know, so her DNA is no longer on the glass. Her lipstick was on the glass for about three years, and, but not anymore. Um, my question was to actually, so the, the stunning scene that you use from The Day I Never Forget, 2002 by Kim, um, is in the politics uh, episode three. And that scene, Kim, is just, so devastating where it's the it's the child talking about FGM and that she's protecting her she, she's telling her mum don't do it to my younger her younger yeah. uh, her younger sister right um so I just wanted to just throw that out there I mean that scene is just that must have been one of those scenes where did you expect it to happen did you know it was coming how were you even there? I mean, it's just extraordinary piece of work. Well, I, th I think there again, I'm bouncing it onto her because what happened was there's a scene earlier in the film, just before it, where we're filming a meeting of women and her mother, she's got big glasses on, is and, and Fazia is there in a lovely little sort of shiny dress and being all dressed up. And her mother is saying how important mm -hmm. it is to, um, 
to, to circumcise, I mean, the, I don't know what, to mutilate, circumcise, whatever, their daughters, otherwise they'll run around and they won't be, you know, and the, the husbands want it. And that little girl, Fazia, was sitting next to her. She was nearly eight, really quietly. And when we were leaving, she came up to me and got grabbed me by the arm and said, I want you to come to my home. And it was quite late then. And I, th I thought, oh, you know, I, I just thought, why? And she said, I want to tell you a poem that I've written. But she was so insistent, she wouldn't let go of me. And I just thought, OK, I'll go back with her. And she set the whole thing up. She said, stand there. And she just did it. Wow. And it was like, and you know how sometimes people say, um, oh, it's, it's really problematical filming children ethically. And um, well, one thing she said at the end of it, I said, um, do you think your mother will keep her promise? And she said, yes, because you're a witness and you filmed it. And the other thing she did was when I saw the poem afterwards, it's a poem, of, uh, it's a poem written to her parents. And it, at the end of the poem she actually wrote when she was recovering, she says, my loving parents, is this what I really deserve? And then she looked at me into the camera and she said, I'm asking all of you, is this what I really deserve? And she told me afterwards that she was saying that to the audience that she knew would watch her in the film. And so I just thought, How, I mean, that's just extraordinary, seven-year-old, you know. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> so, but I think also to the, the, the bravery it took to stand up against her whole culture and say, this is wrong, I'm not going to put up with it. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to speak out against it, even though nobody is supporting me and nobody's ever supported me. I'm still going to, I'm going to choose my moment. And she got us and she read her, you know, told her poem to the camera, which is extraordinary. Extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it's unforgettable. I remember see, I saw that in the cinema, Kim, and I was just trembling afterwards, you know, so it's, you know, thank you so much for and to her as well. Yeah, thank you, Dad. She's Wonderful. Um, thank you, Kim. I think we're going to wrap okay. there and we're going to Lovely bring our next talk. guest in. So um, wonderful to see you. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to w welcome Robin Baker, who is the head curator at the BFI and who has worked in film exhibition, distribution, archiving for 30 years and is also a writer-director. So welcome, Robin. Hello. Hi. Um, so um, I would like to ask first what it makes you, how, what it makes you reflect upon in regards to the work that you do and, and what you would like to ask Mark. Well, firstly, it was a kind of the thrill of discovery and finding things out you don't know, films you don't know, people you don't know, was my instant response. But more than anything, watching it was, it felt like a kind of call to arms. I don't usually watch films where all I'm thinking about really is the legacy, what comes next after it. And it feels like a piece that is going to inform not just my job, but my equivalents around the world. It helps us to shape our thinking. It helps us to identify what is important, what we need to look at, and different ways in which we can change the canon through our own responsibilities. But it's, a, it's such a kind of complex thing you're dealing with. It's not just about archives preserving films or making them um, even available through digitization restoration it's what responsibilities are there for exhibitors how can we create the biggest impact with films because with a film like this we're now talking about as far as i'm concerned a massive shift in what the canon of film history is and that's where i see its absolute volume of absolute importance we now conceive the whole of world history i hope in a different way but to enable far more people to understand what those films are, we have to find ways of making the, them access, accessible. So I just kept thinking about how I work with my international colleagues, how we work and from, I suppose it comes from the basis of how you work with exhibitors to decide what is it between you you want to do? How do you want to bring this ch um, change? and also how you overcome some of the problems around rights. I mean, if 
if you're a film archiver from exhibitor, rights are invariably the biggest stumbling block. So if an archive is to restore a film, to restore a, a film properly is going to set you back a minimum of £60,000, and you're not able to get the rights, or the rights are insanely expensive, then the film can be restored, but it sits in a kind of limbo. So I was thinking of all those kind of challenges and how we best go around that. You know, there's a, um, an organization called FIAF, which is the International Federation of Film Archives. How is it we work together as a body to talk about what kind of change we can make? Can we have a dialogue with organizations like the um, World Cinema Foundation for ensuring and identifying that the right films are restored and therefore come back to us. So I'm afraid to say I got rather distracted while watching the film. I kept thinking of these things that become our responsibilities, also our challenges. But I really think this is the, the point at which things should and can start to change. Um, in terms of question to Mark, <laughs> I mean, the thing that fa fascinates me the most really is, well, one is obviously there is massive breadth, massive diversity of material. But what were your frustrations around what not to be able to include in the film because of lack of availability? Or was almost everything you wanted, you know, there for the asking? Thank you, Robin. Thank you for talking so lovely, beautifully about the global perspective, because that, I think, is a compelling and that's the quietly political aspect of a project like this. In terms of what the frustrations were, you know, uh, I'm lucky to have a really great producer, John Archer, you know, who does a lot of, uh, who, who accesses a lot of material for me, you know, and the frustrations are the, you know, the, the, the kind of horizons of my own knowledge, I have to say, you know, you wake up every day and you realize there's something else you don't know about in this field. And so it, the frustration wasn't access or um, print quality, although I have to say, my God, take a film like Sambi Sanga directed by, you know, Sarah Maldoror. Are, are we still at the point where we can't show it properly? You know, so there are low, we could talk about loads of indi individuals, examples of that, Robin, but more generally, it's more, for me, it's an intellectual frustration rather than I can get access to print frustration. I'm always impatient with my own ignorance. I always think there's lot much more that I don't know. There are great female filmmakers out there that I haven't heard of. And since making this film, I've discovered more. I would say don't beat yourself too much because we've all gained massive amount of knowledge um, as a result, result of it. Um, Thank you. Certainly, it, it really makes you start thinking about those other areas to go into in more depth in the future, not thinking. Um, the biggest single project the BFI National Archives is currently working on is looking at the documentaries made by women documentary filmmakers in Britain from the 40s through to the 60s. And you kind of hope in, your, uh, in that little, its own little way, that contributes again to the body of knowledge you've developed. And if more of us can take on those kinds of projects, the better the situation becomes. I remember we did a um, project online where we were I mean, digitizing 10,000 plus films to put on BFI player. And one of those we put on was a film by Ethel Bat Batley, um, mm -hmm. Britain's first filmmaker. And only a relative handful of um, Batley's films survive. And she always feels to me like the filmmaker we never quite got hold of because she died so tragically young. But, you know, I'd certainly say, most people probably do not know Keep the Home Fires Burning, but there's a film you can watch online. Um, this is from our earliest filmmaker. Robin, can I ask you a question? I was thinking when you were talking there about, you know, our great museums in London that we're always funding and, you know, and they have these huge basements filled with the things that we never get to see, you know, the 20,000 yeah. artists you don't see. And I was wondering relative to men and women, uh, how many men are upstairs for us to see and how many women are in the basement at the BFI? And do you think of it that way? Because this is a great national treasure sitting yeah. in your archive and we are blind to a lot of it, which is a, it's a big problem. It's, it's, a, it's a, a 
problems the whole of Britain, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Yeah, I, I would say across the, um, the history of film, where we've been digitising and restoring, I haven't actually done the number crunching, but when I, I was looking at the films we've restored over the last three, four years, and we've restored films by 26 different women film British women filmmakers over the last three, four years. And given that you know, most of what we do is very early material where there are far, far fewer um, women directors, I know that the team I work with have always championed that as being a priority. We did a project recently on story of British animation and for gra foregrounding people like Alison Devere, Emma Calder, Joanna Quinn was absolutely central to that. Similarly, we did a pro um, project recently looking at artist video in that immediate punk period where we had films from Cordelia Swan, Sophie Muller, Tina Keen, and again, that was so important. But I, I think the real revelation for so many people will be that rewriting of the British documentary in that kind of earlier period. Um, my colleague, um, curator Ros Cranston, is leave it, leading on that. And the kind of people we're talking about, something like Mary Field. I don't know how many people know Mary Field. Um, she was probably the most prolific filmmaker in Britain in the 20s, 30s and 40s, a natural history filmmaker, largely. Yet she's not a name. Her films are not readily accessible. And so there are still so many of these stories that we have that we can re present to people as complete discoverers, even within our own national cinema. And I, I think certainly what we're trying to do is, obviously there are um, women directors of feature films, but what we're also trying to say is, well, actually the opportunities offered to women in the feature film were so small. Yet in other areas of filmmaking, including animation, artist film video and documentary, far more women have had those opportunities. So where we can foreground them, Though, again, for me, the perennial problem is when we're doing this restoration work is to be able to ensure that we can also get the rights for them. Otherwise, it's going to be stuck in some kind of archival film limbo, which does no one any good at all. So that need to be able to sh show it and work out ways in which you're going to create the biggest impact to tell those new stories always feels so um, important to me. But I, I, sorry, back to your original question, the team I work with, and we're a very much we're a 50-50 split between men and women in the curatorial team at the BFI. You know, it, and it's not just women championing films by women, it is all of us. We all see it as a responsibility for what we do. And every conversation when we're shaping a project, both the balance of projects, but also who is represented within those projects is key to what we do. Wonderful. Thank you, Robin. I think now we'll um, turn to audience questions. So thank you for joining us. Um, so, Mark, several um, comments like um, Colm Needham saying we want the 20 hour cut. Yeah, uh, yeah, seriously. You know, we can do that. <laughs> great. OK, bring it on. Um, so one of the questions is, um, was it always your, from Andrew Moore, was it always your intention to put the clips up, in quotes, without framing them with the issues of the female gaze, marginalisation, etc.? It's a great provocative way to present your arguments. Just having women made films as your raw material, was that the plan from day one? Yes. I could give a longer answer, but basically, yes. You know, I mean, there's loads of discussion, particularly in the academic world and the journalistic world, about the female gaze and representation, you know, and, and I've been lots on the barricades a lot, and I talked to lots of people, and I was struck by how little they'd seen, how few films they'd seen, and so the priority was to, you know, increase, just show as much stuff as possible, and not get, not try to or put it in too many contexts, just show as much stuff as possible. Wonderful. Um, we haven't actually talked about your, your cast, the voiceover artists, and I love that you said you chose them because they had all in their own way challenged gender stereotypes. So can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, and so you know, so you want when you want to work with creative people, you want to work with just really creative people, you know, who are very talented. And so, look who we got. You know, we had some of the 
most creative people in the world uh, working in this project as voiceover artists. But in addition, we wanted people who didn't, you know, subscribe to gender norms. You know, this felt it needed to feel a bit androgynous in a way, you know. And if you've got Tilda Swinton and Kerry Fox and Shamila Tagore and, and Ajo Ando and Deborah Winger and, you know, so many people, Tandy Newton and Jane Fonda, you know, these are these are women who have thought about what it's like to be a woman and they've they've thought about the um the, the the exclusions or the oppressions about about gender, and that's exciting for me. You know who uh, I feel similarly, and how you know I'm inspired by every one of their thought processes. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, here's mainly a comment, actually, uh, Eric Real. This is one of the most important documentaries of all film time, and should be mandatory film school viewing. My hand had cramps writing down all the names. I did not know and want to watch. What a road trip. Thank you, Mark. And, and was the name of that person Eric? Yes. Yeah, Eric, I also, I'm sorry to tell you about, about your hand cramp, but there's also a website called womenmakefilm.net where you would find the information about all that. So you might have saved your hand a bit of cramp, but nonetheless, thank you. What a beautiful thing to say. Actually, on that front, Mark, I mean, there's, just endless, endless ways to curate how people then see the films. You've actually, there's a, there's a small list of films featured that are, is on the BFI player, but we're going to be issuing loads. Can we, so can you talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously that's sort of our work now. That's for the curators really to help people yeah. then see yeah. the films because there's going to be a massive appetite. Yeah. You know what I would be really interested in? People... Looking about, looking at the genres, you know, look at women f- sci-fi directors, look at women in um, um, film noir and gangster pictures. You know, the non, ex- you know, we know we've we've had loads of series of films about women directing children and you know women directing you know, sort of domestic dramas all of which is great, and but we sort of know that stuff. But if we want to push out and, inf- and create change and uh, challenge people and explode people's minds, then we have to look into the genres and stuff like that. And who directed the best melodramas? Who d- d- directed, the, directed the, the best war movies? Women. Well, Mia, you were talking about your favourite war, war movie directed by a woman that you discovered through this, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I just couldn't believe that I I had heard the, the title Germany Pale Mother. I had never seen the film. Um, so I am going to hold up my new um, dream discovery. I mean, I just thought Germany Pale Mother is the best film about war I've ever seen. It's, it's amazing. a stunning piece of work. Everyone out there, you can watch it on the BFI player. Like, do it now. Um, as soon as we end this, like, you will not be disappointed. So that is Helga Sanders Brahms. Uh, and I just, I have to see all of her work. And um, I'm, as you were describing it to me, and indeed as a headline that ended up in The Guardian, which was a mistress piece. And these are all mistress pieces and, and not masterpieces. And we have to remember that. And that has to become part of our language, I think, mistress piece. I always thought about the French language and they say auteur, but do they ever say autrice, you know? is there a word in the French language for the female genius film director? You know, maybe not. And and so Mistress Peace, incredibly useful. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to wrap up now. So I just wondered if any of our guests, Kim, Pamela or um, Robin, before we close with Mark, whether you had any parting shots, anything else to leave us with? Putting you on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Pam. <laughs> Well, I brought, I didn't know I had to bring a picture. So I did find my Zettelin in my office. Whoa. I, I, I just want people to know that I bought this autobiography, uh, my Zettelin's autobiography, because I found an online review that said, I know it's her autobiography, but does it have to be all about her? So <laughs> I've never bought anything quicker in my life. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's a remarkable. Could we, could, we, 
just the, the given that you mentioned her, Pamela, could we just say a moment about Zetterling, you know, Swedish movie star, director, working in all sorts of fields, you know, her, made her home in Britain for a while. And, you know, she directed a film produced by the great Don Boyd, you know, and, and, and loads. She, she worked all over the field, you know, and this, there's this sort of creative promiscuity that you see in the great filmmakers and Maya Zetterling is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. As, as an actress and as a filmmaker, she really pushed the boundaries of what was, well, particularly as a filmmaker, of what people found acceptable. She was a very challenging artist. And I was actually so heartened that you had many clips from her because there's there's quite a lot that can't be shown in any documentary. And it was considered so shocking. Yeah. And yeah, shocking, shocking. She was, you know, banned, and, you know, and the, these are the people who we need to learn from. You know, these are the people who, if there are people watching this who are 15, 16, 17, particularly girls and young women, you know, it's like you realize that you're part of a tradition. You know, you're, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of, of giants, to use the cliche, but also, you know, you are not alone and you're part of a way of visual thinking that women have done, you know, which is, which is extraordinary. And my Zetterling is an opportunity, is an example of that. Thank you. Um, all I, yeah, all, all I really want to say was, I know it's an invisible history, but there are filmmakers like Lottie Reiniger. We've digitized loads of her films. They're online. You can even see probably the most prolific woman feature filmmaker, Muriel Box, British woman filmmaker of the 1950s, one of her features, um, which is called The Happy Family, um, set around the South Bank during the Festival of Britain. It's free on BFI Player. So that there are many titles you can watch for free to start reclaiming this history. Um, as I said, Mark has done the groundwork of telling us where to look. So I hope that by making more and more films available, it is going to change understanding. To me, though, it's the scale of the job to be done. And I'd also say if there are any my colleagues from International Archives listening in, let's start talking about this. Let's start talking about it at an international level to see how we can bring about change together. Wonderful. Thank you, Robin and Pamela. Um, Kim, maybe um, since we love your work and your, your, we toured Shooting the Mafia, so everyone, if you haven't seen Shooting the Mafia out there, see that. I, I, I checked and actually I think most of your films are available, Kim, but not all. We'll have a conversation about the ones that aren't um, another day. But I'll you're making on something it. now, um, so can you tell us what it is? I work on something now. Oh, yeah, I mean, I I was nearly fit. We we're like three quarters of the way through, and it's about a singer from Jamaica. And unfortunately, he, we because of the lockdown, we haven't been able to finish it. And he's in a high rise in isolation, um, just on his own. And he's very scared about getting COVID. So we've sort of stopped. But um, but he's a fantastic person. I, you know, he's like uh, another survivor. Had a really terrible childhood, and um, he survived. And I think he's going to be a, a big star. But you won't have heard of him really. But I think he's going to. He's just got the most beautiful voice as well. So yeah. So what is this? It's very. I mean, I just think what you've done here is so good because people are finding ways of 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 you know, us all meeting up and, and doing things out of isolation, which is really, really good. And so I was really pleased. It's like meeting five other people. It's lovely, you know, because I just hate this being just stuck without seeing anybody, you know, except on things like this. So thanks for setting it up, really. And you also, you also have... 14 hours 14 of the best hours. lockdown fuel ever, which is when... I right. know! I can't wait. I'm going to start. Yes. Okay, so um, thank you, Kim, Pamela, and Robin. So um, I think actually, Mark, we've just got one other co um, question, actually. So Dave McAllister said, um, uh, I loved your immersive exploration of how as viewers, you and we curiously engage with the image. How did you choose to chat to subject, which are both intimate and vast in scope? How did I choose to what the subject? The chapter, the, the chapters. The chapter, chapter oh, yeah. So, so yeah, the chapters are <clears throat> these are the chapters 
here. Wow. Um, so I wrote them, I wrote the chapters on this bit of paper. And the, the idea was, you know, when you make a big piece of work, the question is how do you um, structure it? And also how do you not make loads of mistakes, stupid mistakes? So if you can see here, there are individual chapters like economy, jealousy. We didn't use jealousy in the end of work. And I just wanted to make it sort of, in bite-sized chunks in a way, you know, and, and and knew that they want I wanted to be some of the big things like love and death and but also the big cinematic things like tracking shots. So that was why. Wonderful. Um Kate, anything final to ask Mark before we wrap? Um what do you think we're gonna be looking at ten years time on all this? What is your hope that we will now see? Well, Kate, Kate, as you know better than I, there are now f far more women directors than there were even 20 years ago, but not enough still. So, you know, so the, the main thing is to look at and understand the great women who are coming through. And there, you know, there'll be girls, five-year-old girls and 10-year-old girls and young women who are coming through and they will have an innate talent for cinema by which I mean that they are not bound to literature they have a desire to make imagery mm -hmm. and in 10 years time it's their work I, I, I want to make sure that they get places in film schools and whatever else and they're not excluded the way generations and generations of women have been excluded that's great Um, actually, I've got one other question from the audience, which is, so Lee Davis says, do you hope, Mark, that Women Make Film will affect the sight and sound, the next sight and sound poll? Definitely. Yeah. Or maybe the one after that, you know, you know, sight and sound is, you know, this famous film magazine in the UK, a brilliant film magazine, everybody should read it, you know, and it's been, it's been every 10 years, it's asked people what are the great films and it's Orson Welles and Hitchcock and Fellini and somewhere, there's a woman somewhere on the list. But, you know, if this, if, if we really watch the great female directors, then that canon will change and it probably won't change immediately, but in a generation, we have to have to hope that we won't be talking about Kira Murativa or Samitra Perez or Kinyo Tanaka or uh, 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 so many other filmmakers as outsiders. They need to be in the canon rather than outside the canon. A woman to that. Um, so... I am going to give the outro to Alison Gardner, who runs a Glasgow Film Festival and Glasgow Film Theatre, who screened uh, the work in its entirety, Alison, correct? Yeah, I mean, we were one of the festivals just to get in under the wire um, before the, the health emergency hit. We showed uh, Mark's uh, fantastic piece of work in its entirety and had Mark there the very closing night as well. We used it as a lead up to International Women's Day when the festival closed. And on that day, we um, chose to focus all of our films that were either directed by women, written by women, or had women at the heart of the story. It wasn't difficult because we've been championing women filmmakers for a long time at Glasgow Film. I really liked what Mark had to say earlier about, um, let's not do any more panels about women filmmakers. Let's, not, let's stop talking about it and just do it. So we decided to take that approach and we showed five feature films um, in the lead up to Mark's documentary directed by women. So we showed things, The Ascent, uh, Crossing Delancey, Merrily, We Go to Hell, um, my favourite, Olivia, by the beautiful Jacqueline Audrey. So fantastic film, which was great. And I had never seen because, um, and it's a landmark of lesbian representation. It's a beautiful I know, film. I know, I know. Why, <laughs> Alison, why is that not well, better known? I mean, I don't know. But audiences who watched it really loved it. And then we showed Sugar Cane Alley as well. But 
what I noticed at the screenings of Mark's documentary is people were furiously scribbling down, oh my God, I really need to see that. They'd only seen the clip and what they really wanted was that whole picture to see these films in their entirety, to make up their own mind, to make sure that they had that opportunity. And that's one of the things that Glasgow Film Festival and the GFT and working with Reclaim the Frame is really good at. And that is our job, the way forward. And Alison, we'll, um, we can work together as well to show these films just for the next God knows how long, really. I mean, just endlessly, we should be finding these films. And if they're not, if they're not DCP'd, then maybe, which, sorry, technical term, that's <laughs> readable, um, we need to help. I feel like we need to find the resources to make yeah. these films available, right? Yeah, Parks, come on, you're a Glasgow-based <laughs> company, you can be doing this. And as Mark said, his production company that he works with is Glasgow-based as well. You know, Scotland obviously leading the way, not to do with the fact that we've got a woman leader and, <laughs> and the news earlier on aside, you guys are having it tough down there. Um, but these films are um, quite difficult to source. It took us a long time to source Olivia, the Jacqueline Audrey. We had to go round the houses and up and down. These are not easily available, these films, but they should be seen. But from the viewers, just to mention from the viewers' point of view, Alison, that you know, you, you're talking about getting the rights to show them on the big screen, but yes. if people are really hungry, they can go on YouTube and sort of have a, a sort of not a great experience like they can have if you go to the Glasgow Film Theatre and see it on a beautiful screen, but people can get a hit of this stuff before they go to your cinema. Yeah, but there's nothing like that shared dark moment in a cinema that, that we're all missing at the moment, you know, um, and things like this are great, but it's not the same as that, you know, that immediacy of the, the 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 drama, the story, the acting, you know, because, you know, people pick up their phone when they're watching things at home, they're distracted easily. That's where cinema magic really comes into its own, I think. And it was it was great. I mean, we as soon as we put Mark's um, documentary on sale, there was a hardcore of 10 people who bought tickets for every single section. That was it. They really wanted to see it. And then you could see people were dipping in and out. And the chapter's idea is really brilliant. I mean, obviously, I went to all the ones that I thought first that were interesting, like comedy at the moment, because I thought we really need a bit of lightening up, you know. So the chapters is a really great way to get into this, I think. Just choose one or two and really just work your way through them. And that, for me, was the, the joy of it, Mark. It was greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Alison. Wonderful. Thank you. Kate, anything further to add before we close? I just want to thank Mark for doing it and for keeping, I mean, actually having the balls to keep on doing it. If we can say that at this moment that you just hung on there and you weren't being paid at first and you just kept going and going. And I think we're all doing that in, in different ways. And um, I'm just really pleased it's there. And it, it's, you know, a great sort of toy that we now have to play with and investigate. And, and it's given something as a bird's eye view, uh, you know, a huge sort of starting point to jump out for. So thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Seriously, I mean, it's a it's the gift that keeps on giving. And yeah, for everyone interested, we'll just keep helping putting up the, the links to be able to point audiences at the films as much as possible over the next year. Uh, so there's another episode that dropped today, and then there's um, there's five parts, aren't there, that um, across BFI Player, and it's on Blu-ray and DVD, and then on other platforms after that. I understand. So, any any parting shot, Mark, before we wrap? Well, I'd just like to thank you, Mia and Kate, for your time. And you know, it's that thing that you know, there's a euphoria about this. This is not hard work. You know, this is when you see these films, it improves your life. It does. Thank you. There you go. Perfect endpoint. Thank you. Take care.